Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, we pray that this would be a time you would anoint. Lord, we need to hear from you, and uh, we are living in a crazy time. So, Lord, I pray that we will rise and you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as you know, I am usually what you would call an expositor. I like to teach verse by verse through the Bible. That's what comes the most natural for me. And I do topographicals from time to time. And today, in light of the political season that we're in, and in light of the direction that we have seen our country going, and in light of the geopolitical dynamics of the world around us, and in light of being a Christian in the midst of all of that, I felt the need to take this Sunday to talk a little bit about where we as a nation are heading. Now, I heard a couple other pastors who have deviated from their teaching to do much the same thing, and I'm in agreement with pretty much everything they say. But the world right now is nervous. I mean, you can sense it. You can feel it. There's this sense of uncertainty about the future. We've become so divided in this country. Like to disagree with somebody is it's like to hate them or to think they're stupid because they don't it's just it's amazing what we've become and there is this brewing sense of volatility that you can taste it's like you can barely say anything without it being accused of something or being divisive I by nature am not an alarmist so when I say things, I, I'm, not the kind, I'm not the guy that's going to run, run around saying the sky is falling, the sky is falling. I do not want to be a chicken little. But, nor do I want to be a little chicken when it comes to honestly evaluating the days that we are living in. We need to be intellectually honest. We need to call things as we see them. Because there's a direction that we're advancing that concerns me. In the book of Revelation, there's an interesting verse. It occurs while the judgments are being poured out on a God-rejecting world. Now, a quick flyover, you know, Revelation chapters 6 through 18 is like this, the, where the judgments are. It's, a, it's harsh. And in the midst of that, Judgment In the end of chapter 9, we read in Revelation chapter 9, verse 20, it says, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Then get this. This is the thing that got me this week. Listen to the four things that sinful man will just not let go of. Next verse, 21. And they did not repent of their murders or of their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. Murders, sorceries, sexual immoralities, and theft. I think it's reasonable to assume that as judgment approaches, we would see an escalation of these things. In fact, not only will we see an escalation, but we will see a vehement tenacity to defend these very sins. The very sins that not only defy God, but demand judgment if God is holy. Those four things, they would not, and this really kind of struck me as I was just going through Revelation. It said they would not repent of their murder. Number one was murder. The word there is faunus. I believe, as 
the time approaches, we are witnessing a cheapening of the value of human life. Now, earlier this week, some of you may know, and I'm not a social media kind of guy, but I did make a little post um, about abortion, and the pushback was very telling. Now, it wasn't a mean post. It was a post about the depravity of a sinking society. You would have thought that I say, said something like, all women have cooties, or something really like <laughs> bad like that. Like, like, I hate women, or something like that. And I don't. I, the truth is, I love them, and I want to protect them, born and unborn. The progressive incrementalism in which abortion has had is very concerning. Remember, it, it went from every, it should be safe, legal, and rare. And now we're at anyone at any stage. I think that's telling. I was surprised because not only those of you who may have seen some of the, I got private messages from people where I dialogue back and forth. I've, I've deleted some of the responses. I've covered some of the responses. They made it all political. I had one guy this morning, it's like, it was about Trump and he, it's like, it has nothing to do. This was a moral statement. It has nothing, I, I wasn't, I didn't say that as an endorsement. I said it as a, an issue of morality. To me, it was never, abortion is never a political issue. It's a moral one. But with that said, the vehement tenacity in which they fight for the right to kill the infants betrays a deeper and darker agenda. Now, I'm very, I have a very strong opinion, and we can some other time talk about Old Testament child sacrifices, Molech, blood leading sacrifice, to the, all of these different things. But to keep this in context, I am aware that there are other applications to they would not repent of their murders, right? But I think this fits within that spectrum. I think that's where I'm trying to go. Life is cheap, and we're watching it get cheaper as time goes by. And this is something we should expect to see. This is a trend we should expect to be seeing if we actually take the Bible seriously. Next, it said, nor would they repent of their sorceries, number two. And the word there is pharmakia. Now that word has, <clears throat> excuse me, a wide application from pharmacon, a drug or a spell-giving potion, or a druggist, pharmacist, or poisoner, or by extension, magician, or sorcerer, <clears throat> excuse me, it depends what you look up. Others will say it's a methodology of communion um, with spirits or, with, or spirit influences. Now, I think it's both. But the point is this. If I were to take the Bible literally, then I should expect to see a day and age with an increase of the pharmaceutical industry impacting humanity. Even, to make money, at the expense of human life. Murder. This is an evil that mankind will not repent of. In the name of control, they will gladly exploit fellow man. Be it spiritual, be it chemical, be it both. It's exceedingly lucrative. The love of money is behind this. Others when they see this point, they say, well, they're talking about an evil, occultic, supernatural manipulation that will come to pass in the latter days. I believe it's both, personally. 
nor would they repent of, number three, on that list of four, sexual immorality. And of course, the word is pornea. So if I were to take the Bible literally, I would expect to see a growing obsession with sexual deviancy in the culture that I'm in. And we are so sexually confused right now that we can't name the numbers of genders because it's ambiguous. It's no longer about X's and Y's. So much for following the science. Child sex trafficking is growing around the world. We want to make believe it's not a thing, but it's a big thing right here in this state and all around the world. It's a huge industry. And the rich, we're giving puberty blockers to children. Children who are, it's just crazy. Because you're castrating them, you're changing the rest of their life. These are kids that still are deciding whether or not they should eat their boogers, right? <laughs> And, and, and they're struggling with identifying with certain things. And we're saying, there, there, it's okay. And then we're affirming things that we shouldn't. And they're going to make decisions. We're giving gender-affirming surgeries to these young people. All in the name of comp compassion. May I tell you, it's really in the name of corruption and money. Monogamy is outdated. And the younger generation has been robbed of the very intent in which God created marriage. It's not displayed. It's not represented anymore. We've become a self-indulgent, self-defying, self-defiling people that will not repent of our sexual perversion. So we are marinating the culture in our own lust, bringing the children up in this. And lastly, it said they would not repent of their, number four was thefts. The word there is klemma. Taking what isn't yours to take. An exploitation of the weak be it through our murders, be it through our sorceries, or be it through our sexual immoralities. Exploiting the weak. Taking from them. So we, or, or they, can live a more self-indulgent life. Now I know that that was just a very cursory flyover. But my main point is that we are seeing the trends that we should expect to see if we are taking the Bible literally. It's around us. And as I say, I'm not by nature an alarmist, but I am not by nature one who wants to stick his head in the sand either. I want to be a realist. In fact, if you believe the scriptures, then the newspapers will make a lot more sense to you. Let me share with you a portion of an article that I read, Dateline, November 2nd, yesterday. This is the quote. The comprehensive Tweety, Tweety, there we go, a Tweety. <laughs> it's a peace Tweety. <laughs> Sylvester won't eat birds anymore. He, he made a peace Tweety. Okay, I'm going to try this quote again. The comprehensive treaty between Iran and Russia will include military cooperation and may pose a threat to Israel. Russian Foreign, foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said on Thursday that the treaty on a comprehensive strategic partnership between Russia and Iran that is being prepared will become a serious factor in the strengthening of Russian-Iranian relationships. The agreement, according to Lavrov, is expected to be signed in the very near future. Now, this should not come as a shock to any serious student of the Bible. 
Right? We, we read the Bible and we see how Russia will be drawn in Ezekiel 38. Russia will be drawn into a major conflict with Israel. We often wonder how. In fact, God literally says that he will put hooks in their jaws. It's kind of like they're going to be dragged into this. That's what treaties do. Now, the timing of the Magog invasion is debated, and that's for another time. But the point is, when you have read the play, and you understand the play, and suddenly you're watching the actors starting to take their place on the stage, it's time to take notice. Now, I say all of this not to make anyone nervous, but we need to be aware. This week we have a major election. And it seems that I, there is this part in the church that's not sure where they stand. Or even if they should vote. And if so, whom should they be voting for? Now, I'm not going to flat out tell you who to vote for. And the reason I'm not going to, I mean, I, I think it's very clear. But the reason I'm not telling you is, is because it needs to be your conviction, not mine. But what I am going to tell you is you need to look at the issues through a biblical perspective if you are a Christian. Okay? That's important. If you have a biblical worldview, that should impact your perspective on everything, including politics. Now, some listening might be thinking, whoa, whoa, I don't know if I like where you're going. The church is not the place to bring up politics. And I'm sure many of you have heard separation of church and state, had that thrown in your face. And I know, I believe, that I'm preaching to the choir when I remind you that the term separation of church and state is not found in our founding documents, right? You know that, right? It, is, it was the originally, the exact phrase, separation of church and state, is derived from Thomas Jefferson in a letter he wrote in 1802 to the members of the Danbury Baptist Association in the state of Connecticut. And in that letter, he mentioned a wall of separation between church and state. That's, that's where that originates from, from that letter. But a lot of people just seem not to know that. What they'll do is, okay, all right, fine, but, you know, Don, the First Amendment, the First Amendment, like, what does the First Amendment say? Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Hands off. Or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or of the right of the people to peacefully assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. You see what's being said there? It's not about keeping the church from impacting government. It's about keeping the government out of the church. But that's not what they, they're telling you when they mention that. But some of you might be thinking, fine, but you know what, to be honest, I'm not thrilled with either candidate. And you know what? That's fair. That's fair. Others might be thinking, you know what? I don't like it because it comes down to the lesser of two evils. You've heard that. Maybe you feel that. And you know what? You're right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. That's true. Well, I don't feel I need to bring a clothespin into the election booth this time. It's clear that our candidates are indeed flawed. They're flawed people. In fact, that has always been the case. Until the day that Jesus is on the throne, every election will indeed be a choice between the lesser of two evils, between two fallen people. Now, there are not a lot of Choices that you're going to experience in life that check every box. 
that make you feel 100%. So, what do we do? Number one, be aware. Right? That's what, what, why I'm talking about what's going on. We need to be aware. We, we need to know what's going on in the world around us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. He says, see that you are seeing what's going on around you. Circum, around, spec, see. So that you understand what's going on around you. Don't walk like a fool. Don't put on your blinders. So number one, be aware. We need to be awake. Not woke. But we need to be awake to the reality of what's going on. Why? Remember in Genesis chapter 4, God said to Cain, If you do well, will you not be accepted? But this is the part. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Your translation might say, crouches at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. You see the picture? It's like there's this evil that exists. It's real. It is poised to strike. And it will when we allow it. All you got to do is nothing. That is the default mode of the fallen nature of man. It will be exploited. Its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. The enemy will exploit any legal ground that we give him. And we are giving him a lot. And the church has been giving him a lot. Where are we conceding? You can ask it personally. In, in, in my life, in your life, where personally have I been giving the enemy legal ground? You know, a toehold that'll become a foothold, that'll become a stronghold, or whatever. But where, where, did I, where did that initial compromise, or where is it in my life? Good question. Where is it as a culture? As Christians, we need to recognize the rising tide of evil that seeks to pervade our culture. Look around you. Look at what's happening. Look at the corruption. Look at Hollywood. The dark side is as dark as you can imagine and probably even darker. Politics. The music industry. We need to understand what's going on. And that brings me to my second point. Number one was be aware. And number two, vote. Vote as an informed voter. Be aware, be informed, and vote. Edmund Burke nailed it when he said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. In other words, if you don't vote, sin is crouching, and it will gladly take whatever it can. Nature might abhor a vacuum, but your enemy does not. It's always easier in the short term to do nothing in a difficult time, but that's not what we are created for. And God is looking for people who will take the initiative to speak the truth in hard places, but to speak the truth. Say what needs to be said and be sure that you do it in love. Now, I can tell you firsthand, even if you do it in love, you will get pushed back. It's going to happen. So, number one, be aware. Number two, vote as an informed person. Number three, vote your biblical values. That's what you need to do. Vote your biblical convictions. 
I do not seek, I have no desire to be known as a political person, but I do seek to be a biblical one. And that is why I want to do what I do, because I want to be biblically motivated, not politically motivated. Now, I have found that often as I am being biblically motivated, other people are saying, well, that's political. I want to be, I want to approach things biblically. I know the scripture tells us, Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but a sin is a reproach to any people. Knowing that vacuum that nothing brings when we do nothing. I see if, if I want this nation to be lifted up, then I should vote accordingly to biblical principles. Because I'm a Christian. Long before anything else. Yeah, my, I'm not a, by nature, I'm not a political person. My drive is to clean the fish, not the pond. That's just the way my perspective is. And I believe the washing of the water of the word is what does that. And that's why I do what I do. But I also realize we are never going to live in a man-made theocracy. Don't look for it. Don't expect it. Be realistic. Don't act as if you're voting for a pastor or a, a spiritual leader. We have our ideal. There's, there's what's ideal and then there's what's real. And the truth is, it, it, this right now, it's a binary election. It comes down to two. You can't say, well, where's C? There is no C, unless C means to do nothing, and that will bring a bad result. So with that said, I am concerned for the future of our country. I see freedoms that are, I believe are going to be in jeopardy. I see a coming day when I come up and open the scriptures and somebody will say, that's hate speech. You can't say that anymore. I believe that day is coming. It's already come in other places. Remember the book 1984? That was not an instruction manual. That was a warning. Jesus instructs us to be salt and light. Salt. We are to delay the putrefication of the culture. That's what salt does. It's a preservative. Someday the salt will be removed and the world will get what it wants. And it will lead to its own demise rather abruptly. So this is where it gets down to brass tacks. I hope you're not looking for someone to save this country. Neither he nor she can and won't save the country. I'm going to plagiarize this quote because it was so good. Good government cannot save us, but bad government will destroy us. Our leaders are flawed, but they always have been, and they always will be. We're not voting for a savior, we're voting for a president. And God has always used flawed, sinful people. I mean, I'm behind the pulpit. What does that mean? That means God can draw a straight line with a, with a broken crayon, right? God can do amazing things. So, be aware. Vote as an informed person. Vote biblical values. And four, vote policy over personality. Both of them have a record of policy. Both of them have a list of achievements they've done in office. They've both had a crack at this. We're not walking in going, well, what, you know, what's this going to look like? We both have a, they both have a record. 
If you go by personality, what's going to happen is you might invite a lot of detrimental policies in the name of your personal feelings. <clears throat> He's mean. He says harsh things. You're right. I know. I know. She never answers a question directly. She just serves this word salad. You're right. I know. <laughs> we all know that. But this is a binary election. And these are your two choices, like it or not. The question isn't even who's more likable. The question is who will do best with the issues at hand. And they both have a record for you to research on the issues. Which brings me to the final thing, the issues. And as a Christian, I, mean, I can give you a partial list of things that these issues will impact us all. So take these issues and do your homework. Number one, economy. That's a big issue, right? It's always has been, right? It's the economy, stupid. I mean, that's the big issue. Who has the perspective that you agree with? Another major issue, clearly, border security. Now, I have heard interesting biblical arguments on both sides of this issue about taking in refugees and being compassionate and, and the borders that God drew for Israel and the tribes. God makes boundaries. He makes borders. And it's an interesting thing. Here's the question. What is the proper way to immigrate? Legally. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Here's another issue. But these are, these are the issues. This is what we need to, to be honest and look at. The next one is Israel. Listen. Israel is going to be a very, very real issue. It's happening now. It's happening now. We knew it would. It's a matter of time. There's certain things that are going to happen. I can't explain to you exactly the order. I have several guesses that it, which it can be. But man, it's going to be a very real issue in the near future. And we are watching the world turn against her again. And on this one, I will remind you what God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless those that bless you and curse the ones that curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the Messiah is going to come through that, but be careful how you treat Israel. Now, this does not mean that I say yes to every decision Israel has made. They have made things that I have disagreed with, but that's not the point. I don't want to be on the wrong side of history. You want an interesting study, go back to Matthew, look at the judgment of the sheep and the goats and see what the deciding factor was and put it in the timeline. So what they did with it is, it's just, we need to be mindful of that. And where you, we have a binary choice on how that's going to be dealt with. Again, I'm going to be honest. I, we all have our opinions. To me, it's really clear. Religious freedom. Government should not force people to violate religious convictions through selective enforcement. Look, if you're an atheist and you don't want to bake a cake for a Christian event, fine. I'll go elsewhere. There's lots of other people that will take a, bake a cake and take my money, right? Should the government mandate vaccines? Should Christian hospitals be forced to do abortions? Religious freedom is going to be a very real issue as the spiritual forces polarize, which is what we are witnessing. A lot going on behind, behind the veil. The next issue 
Uh, judges, right? That's a big one. <laughs> judges. What kind of judges do you want? Because there is a there is a spectrum that different people want. Do you want an activist judge? Do you want a a constitutional judge? You know. Clearly, that's going to impact the country for years to come. That's one of the big issues. Here's another one. And this one really concerns me. Sex and biology. What? They've been coming at the kids for a long time now. Elementary children should not be forced to have to endure gender studies. Mixed bathrooms, men crushing women in women's sports. It's crazy. And on that one, it's pretty clear where they stand. Family. Parental rights versus states' rights. If you don't think that's an issue, then you haven't read about some of the legislation that they're trying to pass. Parental rights versus states' rights. What is the state allowed to do? Where, what is too far? I read this morning in New York about them going in and taking a guy squirrel and killing him because they thought it had rabies, so they had to test it. This squirrel was an internet sensation. So the state came in and took the squirrel because there was rabies in the area and they took this guy's pet and raccoon and had to test him for rabies. And of course, the way you test him for rabies is killing him. Is that overreach? What is the acceptable standard of, of reach and overreach? That's a real issue. As we grow in this surveillance state, as it becomes more and more, when, when, as they start talking about things like social credits and what that means, very real issues. And of course, as I brought up in the beginning, there's the issue of abortion. That's going to be clearly a very real issue. That seems to be the hill to die on. No pun intended. In reality, neither candidate is truly pro-life. That's just the truth. Personally, I am. Yeah. And clearly, I've tilted my hand on this one, and I can't help it. Because on the list of things that God hates, you see in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 17, we see a proud look. You see a lying tongue. I know that alone covers half of politics, I know. But in hands that shed innocent blood. And I must say, when Planned Parenthood bought a mobile clinic to offer free abortions at the, D the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, I did not see that as something to be celebrated. It's one thing to be an overcomer. It's another thing to be an overlooker. And I can't overlook the magnitude of death at our hands and I am confident that God won't either. Now, I, like I said, I'm a Bible teacher. I seldom share my heart this way on topographical issues. I'm not into pep rallies. I'm not a life coach. I'm not into spiritual manipulation. But I think it's paramount that these issues are brought up and discussed and there's informed decision making for such a time as this. But with all that said, here's the good news. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. You see, Uzziah was a good king. He brought the nation to great heights. But then he died. 
No doubt the people were uncertain about the direction of things. The great king, he, he's gone. What happens now? What direction are we going to go? Who is going to take the throne next? It's not a good feeling, is it? But look who is still on the throne. In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seating on the, seating on the throne, high and lifted up. He is still on the throne no matter which way things go. No matter where the election goes, whether you're your you're girl, your guy, whoever, God is still on the throne and he's never blindsided and he's going to work out his plans to his glory. And in the meantime, we occupy. We don't live a life where our goal is to successfully make it to death. We occupy, we be salt, we're to be light, we're to share the blessed hope. As multitudes are walking around, even in some of these correspondences, you could sense the weight and guilt of decisions made in people's past. They need to know the joy of being forgiven and being set free. And might I add to everything, I know that I've spoken about abortion more than probably ever with, you, with this group. Um, I never want to talk about abortion without bringing up the glorious, redemptive work of Jesus Christ and the cross. For I've done worse things, but I've been a grace case. And the last thing I want to do is, if I talk about abortion, is to be hammering somebody who's sitting here with some type of condemnation when they need to know there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can be set free from that. That's why he came. There was the purpose of his coming, to seek and save that which is lost. We just don't want to keep defending the things that get us lost. We need to change our thinking. That's what the word repentance means. It's to change our thinking. See it God's way. He has a better plan. He has our eternal objectives at hand. We have our temporary indulgences and satisfactions at hand. We want to evade discomfort when often it's the very discomfort that's going to season you because God has your eternal benefits in mind. People need to know the glorious gospel and we need to be sharing it. We need to share the blessed hope around us. And so while I'm not a political person and I don't delight in being divided, I'm a peacemaker at heart. And I don't delight taking my sword. And I, I, there was a season, I think before I, got, before I was a Christian, oh, I, I'd like to, to do the war of the wits thing. It gratified ego, right? I mean, it all started off when I was in an elementary school when kids would rank on each other. If I could outrank them, then I win, right? It's a shallow victory, We've, but we have, we have uh, um, changed it a lot. And there was a time when I, 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 was, I was okay with that, but now it's like, you can win an argument and lose a soul. Big deal. That's a shallow victory. We're talking eternity without Jesus hopelessness they need to know the blessed hope and they need to see the joy of a redeemed soul and we need that's why we don't want to be walking oh this election oh boy if it if if she gets in if he gets in you know no 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 praise god right either way god will be glorified and we need to be about our father's business invite them Invite them to receive Christ. Share the gospel. Tell them, Jesus, that's, God loves you so much that he was willing to take the condemnation that all of us deserve upon himself. Invite them. It's a nervous time. And the world needs to see the reality of the peace in the redeemed souls. 
That's what we need to be doing. So, we'll, Lord, we, we thank you. We thank you you called us for such a time as this. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, your will would come to pass. Lord, let it not be said of us that we didn't do what we're called to do when the time came. Lord, we, we know it's in your hands and we know that you are on the throne. We know you give and you take away, but you will always be blessed and you will always be our king. We thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.